Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Mutuality Month series of events. I am, we are, yeah, we're having a series of events and this is uh, Nurturance Luring Part Two, Legal Ethics in an Interdependent World. And um, I, sorry, every time uh, someone comes in the breakout room, I, I mean, to the waiting room, I, my thing freezes. Okay, let's see if tech will stick with us this time. So yeah, legal ethics in an interdependent world. Um, well, I should say I'm Janelle Orsi from Sustainable Economies Law Center. This is some newish material that I'm excited to share with you all and also just hear your thoughts on. It's something I've been grappling with a lot. I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about the word ethics and also interdependent um, and then go on to, to grapple with what it means with the rules of professional responsibility. So yeah, those professional rules, they definitely, you know, they, they kind of hang together as a whole and make sense when you've been trained to think within a certain box. Like you go to law school, you learn this whole legal system and it's like, okay, yeah, the rules, the rules, they feel like they make sense. But from other perspectives and perspectives where I've been really trying to zoom out lately and see the world in a different way and ask big questions, it starts to get kind of complicated to understand how it fits together. And I'll, I'll share that, you know, some of my zooming out and learning is learning about biology and ecosystems, learning about indigenous cultures, um, reading some great books about the law. There's various other people kind of rethinking law and how humans organize themselves, great organizations doing so. And I've wrangled with this a lot and I've, I've written a lot of things and shared them. So um, you'll be able to come back to these slides and click on the links and enjoy. So I'm gonna start by talking about this word ethics, which I've never loved because it feels so like moralistic, like you should do this. So I'll, I'll tell you what the word ethics means to me. Um, and a little bit more about me, I'm 42 years old and I've been reflecting a lot just about changes that have happened in my lifetime and really trying to like confront it and take it all in and learning that like in the space of my lifetime, things have really changed a lot. And when things change gradually, you don't really notice it, but just a 38% decline in, in animals in the world, like vertebrate animals, the total population of them during my lifetime since I think um, 1976-ish, something like that. So that's like, okay, whoa. There's also the concentration of wealth just in my 42 years has drastically exploded. Like 85% of the wealth in the world is controlled by the top 15% of people. So that's been happening during my lifetime. I, I put another chart here so you could take that in. Also, I, I grew up seeing monarch butterflies coming up the West Coast, and I've learned that in my lifetime, actually just in the last 30 years, they have declined by 98%. So a lot can change in a lifetime. And at any given moment, I feel like we can look around, I look around, and I think, well, all right, a lot of bad stuff has happened, but we're basically okay, right? Like, at the moment, I'm okay, you're okay. And then we kind of go on with our lives, we don't change anything drastically. But if somebody had told me when I was a baby, like Janelle, all of this loss is going to take place in the first, say, half of your life, then I would have been very unhappy. I would have really wanted people to change things a lot, like dramatically. And so now I'm like really trying to take in like, what's going to happen in the next 42 years of my life? And really taking in the, the predictions of climate scientists, watching the trends of inequality, um, you know, the racial wealth gap is growing. Um, yeah, it's like, it's a lot of bad, bad news. Sorry to start with all the bad news, but it's all to say like, this is my understanding of the word ethics is, it's like what we should be doing, like how we should behaving, be behaving right now so that we can still look babies in the eye. Um, and so for me, it changes a lot about how I live my life and how I do my work. So that's ethics. That's like ethics in the broader sense. But then there's professional ethics, this kind of odd set of rules 
that we learn as lawyers. And I've been trying to take these two shapes of ethics and figure out how do these things fit together? And there's spaces between them that allow them to connect and fit together. And, and one, you know, professional ethics does have to adapt to the changing circumstances in the world, the changing interests of our clients. So I want to say the fit is awkward, but doable, maybe, but that'll be for us to discuss. I think it's really interesting to explore. So that was ethics. What about interdependent world? I kind of feel like everyone knows sort of like, yeah, duh, we're all interdependent. That's kind of like, you know, if you think about it conceptually, it's like, yeah, we understand that. But there's also just like what we're seeing happening in the world is telling us like, wow, everything we do affects everything else. Every carbon molecule that we throw into the atmosphere adds to the aggregate. Every, every cruel word that we speak adds to the overall culture of cruelty. And it's just, it all kind of adds up. And it, it means like everything we do affects everything else. It all matters, which also leads me to the conclusion that we need each other. If we're all affecting each other, then we really need to turn to each other and say, what can we do differently? How can we work differently, consume differently? We're going to need to support each other through challenging losses and grief. We're going to just need to, yeah, we need each other. Conveniently, this was the conclusion of the last webinar I did, Nurturance Learning Part 1. So there's a theme here, y'all. But um, So yeah, interdependent world and... In the, last, <clears throat> in the last 15 years since I graduated from law school and in the last 12 and a half since we started Sustainable Economies Law Center, I feel like I've been observing an arc of change in just what it is that people want for themselves and for the world. And so many people are kind of having these dreams that when I get to hear people's dreams, I'm like, wow, that is so similar to what other people have told me recently. And we have a walk-in legal advice clinic, the Legal Cafe where we've advised over 2,300 grassroots groups and enterprises and cooperatives over the years. And so people just come to us and they share our dreams. We're in such a lucky position to hear them. And that what people are asking us to support them to do is create spaces where people can come together and flourish and grow food and feed each other and take care of each other, take care of strangers. And I start to picture that's a you know, map of Oakland. You know, I just start to picture all of these things starting to weave together into a broader uh, transformation. So it means that I'm hopeful in the sense that there's beautiful things happening. These beautiful things are gonna keep happening no matter what else is happening in the world. These things are still gonna be here. So it's like, I am gonna be part of this as a lawyer. And you know, these are both new and ancient ways of being together. It's people really leaning into their interdependence. So that's happening. And what does it mean for the clients that we're seeing? And I know not everybody here works for Sustainable Economies Law Center. I know several of you all volunteer. So you know this and you've seen this, but I, I have a feeling that many people in this webinar are here because they are seeing, you all are seeing shifts in how people, in what people want and what they're doing. And so these are five things I'm gonna talk through. <clears throat> of just like how I see our clients showing up differently. And one of them is they're acting in mutual interest, not in this kind of rational self-interest, you know, homo economicus, you know, typical economic thinking way that we, we expect people to act or that I should say Western civilization has come to believe that, you know, best outcome is if everyone just acts for their special, their rational self-interest. So yeah, clients acting from mutual interest trusting each other, not trying to like control everything and control each other. They tend to be non-hierarchical and kind of self-organizing organic groups of people, but they're, they're not just insular groups. They tend to be nested in broader, broader networks, broader movements. And yeah, they're living these both ancient and new ways of being, which often, very, very often, our system hasn't made, our legal system hasn't made space for, and our legal system may even be disrupting them. So for professional ethics purposes, this brings up a lot, like a lot that, that we have to grapple with. I'm going to take a little sip while I show you a boring slide. So <clears throat> I'm going to just make a, a note about the rules of uh, professional ethics. Um, 
I know a lot of people here are California lawyers, a lot not, but I'm going to be referencing the California rules because um, this is a California CLE credit. And uh, also California rules were, they were kind of overhauled four years ago. And some of the overhaul was helpful in that the numbering system now matches up with the ABA model rules. They don't, the, the rules don't exactly mirror each other, but there's some more, um, there's some more overlap now. Although I will say the, the overhaul, part of the purpose was to not disrupt a lot of the uh, precedent that's been set, um, to kind of leave it in place, even though some of the wording has changed. I think there was an intention to not really change the rules all that much. And you can go on and read. Actually, I linked to the rules in here in a bunch of places. If you go click on it, it takes you not only to the rules, but to the old rules and how they've been edited and then commentary both about the new rules and commentary about the edits that were made. So um, maybe that's far more than you really care to know about. Uh, and I linked to some ethics opinions and yeah. So I've been kind of digging around in these rules lately. So let's just start with, you know, I mentioned the interests of our clients feel different. feels like there's a trend of, you know, clients are not coming to lawyers saying like, help me get as much as I can out of this transaction. Help me minimize all my individual loss and maximize my gain. You know, I mean, that's kind of an exaggerated view of how clients can be, but that's, you know, people are taking a very definitive step away from that toward mutual interest with a goal more, not so much to get as much as they can, but to give, but not just give in a sort of charitable way, but in like within a set of relationships where it's like, we're taking care of ourselves by taking care of each other. And that's kind of the mutual mutuality showing up. And so we have one of our rules around diligence is to be dedicated to the interests of our client. So that I'm going to throw in some practice tips here. Like one is to at the outset of the relationship and probably throughout, ask clients to name what their interests are um, so that you're really clear. Like you're, they may be looking for a very different, to, for a lawyer to support them to have very different relationships than, than maybe typical clients would be asking typical lawyers to do. Um, so yeah, asking people to really share their purpose, their goals, their values, and, and have it be explicit in writing where possible. So that's the client's interest. There's also, what about the lawyer's interest? Because we know like skipping down now to the, the rules around conflicts of interest. Um, this, you know, this comes up a lot. You know, when you think about the rules that come up the most, and I think I've read conflicts of interest, diligence, and competence are the the, and, and communication with clients are the issues that come up the most for lawyers. Even though there's a whole bunch of rules, it kind of boils down to those four that come up a lot. So yeah, a lawyer um, needs to be really aware of how the lawyer's own interests could affect their representation. And then the commentary on the rule talks about, you know, it's like, you really should share with the client your other, your interests, responsibilities, relationships, whether it's personal, professional, business, financial. So the rules are kind of recognizing we live in an interdependent world, like lawyers themselves are um, suspended in a web of relationships that could affect the relationship with the client. Um, and you're, you're supposed to spell these out and get the client's written informed consent um, to the representation after they understand how that could affect your representation. So lawyers have to provide so-called competent representation. And in the last webinar, we talked about this word competence a little bit and the, and the fact that the word compete is in it. And that often sort of implicit in the idea of competence is this idea that you are gonna fight. And, and the word zealous even comes up in the ABA model rules, I think it is, you know, zealously compete on behalf of your client that you're gonna be a machine of domination on behalf of that client. And again, that may be exaggerated, but that, that is a little bit of the expectation and it may not be what our clients are looking for. That may not be the form of competence that our clients are seeking in a lawyer. They may be looking for a lawyer that's more collaborative and adaptive and that aligns with the client's 
goals of building more interdependent webs of relationships. So practice tips. Yeah, describe your own values and purposes as a lawyer. So it's very clear um, who it is that they're hiring. Give the client a sense, like you're really supposed to like spell it out a little bit of like, here is how my belief system might affect or bias uh, the legal work that I provide to you. And yeah, the, the consent does need to be in writing. I can't read what I wrote at the bottom. <laughs> what did I say? Possibly. Uh, I can just move my thing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's an important point is that throughout the lawyer client relationship, like circumstances change, people's views change, people freak out, they get emotional, all kinds of things could happen that affect the so-called competent representation of the client. I think it's important to just continually talk about it. And because the, the consent needs to be in writing, um, you know, try to put it in writing, um, you know, by email and just sort of acknowledge how things are changing and, and just be in a, in a constant state of dialogue with clients about how it's going. Um, like here's an example of something Sustainable Economies Law Center has done because we, um, you know, we have a particular vision for the world and we want there to be land and housing for all. We have a strong critique of the real estate system and the speculative market. And so we represent all these lawyers, I mean, sorry, we re represent all these clients who are organizations taking title to land. And we've put something more or less like this in one of our legal service agreements, which is just that, you know, our particular viewpoint about real estate could lead us to encourage you to not profit from your own property. And the great thing is that's what clients are coming to us to do. Like that's the reason they hired us. But it's just really important to make that explicit. And I'll, I'll share more in a minute about why that's so important. Um, just, well, I guess I'll just say it now is just that at some point, you know, if there's conflict with a client, an outside party may be judging whether the relationship was reasonable or whether your competence, whether it was reasonable to believe um, that you could provide competent rep representation. So being really clear about your shared goals, especially when they're unconventional, um, is important because a reasonable person would see, okay, this is a different standard of competence here. So yeah, just to paint more of a picture, like a lot of our clients are organizations who own land and then when they become aware that they're landlords, that's funny, I just realized that I also have a sign behind me, land without landlords. They become aware that they're landlords. It's kind of weird to them. It's like, what? No, like we're, we're, we're creating a whole different world, a more caring and loving world and we're landlords now. And I had to kind of get underneath why that was freaking them out. And it's because, you know, landlord tenant relationship is a relationship of domination. There's huge power differentials and so yes, our clients are landlords, but what are they asking us to do? They're not asking us for the most part to make sure that they're protected in every way. They're not asking us to foresee every contingency or possibility and protect them. Um, and they're not asking us to give them the right to immediately evict a tenant who becomes, who's not able to pay or, or if they become unreasonable. Um, they're not really asking us for that. Like that just doesn't feel right. But you know, when you're a lawyer and you go to the practice guides and you pull up a sample lease agreement from the practice guides, there'll be the lease agreement for the landlord or for the tenant. And they each have different paragraphs. You know, there's a landlord friend friendly one, the tenant friendly one. And, but anyways, that's, you know, our clients are just like, no. we want to have good, clear relationships. We want to support residents. We don't want to make people homeless, like help us comply with the law but also support us to create these relationships we wanna create. Um, and I put a lot of thought into, yeah, just how do we support our clients to make agreements? Where a lot of us are transactional lawyers, we write a lot of agreements, say you can call them lease agreements and really trying to help people use those agreements as a space to describe the very different relationships they're creating with each other. And I linked here to, a slideshow I created that's um, using octopuses as inspiration for creating agreements in a different way. And, um, but it's like, it's our clients and their relationships. They should really be the ones 
shaping them. And so if lawyers come in with boilerplate agreements, so often it just doesn't fit to the situation. And, you know, our clients want to write something different. And yes, they, they know, or we could always talk to them about it, the fact that, well, you're not using a typical, typical agreement, you know, everything could go wrong. You know, if you don't require your tenants to pay rent, or you don't allow yourself to evict them, if they don't pay rent, you know, that could put everyone in a really tough position. And they're like, you know, that's okay. That's what we we're trying to do something different here. And so again, it's like, you know, that could sound like malpractice in a sense of not providing competent um, lease agreements to clients, or it's actually competent in the sense that it's sensitive to the client's needs. And on that note, uh, communication with clients, there's the rule 1.4 about that. And, you know, I write, I try to write legal documents that are in plain language and I use graphics a lot. And, um, and I just think it's so important. Like over the years, I have realized even lawyers have a hard time understanding lawyer words. It's just, it does not speak to our natural ways of understanding things. And so I think it's, I think it's actually a responsibility in a sense, an ethical responsibility to, to rethink what it is we're providing to clients, how we're communicating with them. And another note about like what it is we're communicating about is, you know, there's an acknowledgement. This is actually a comment to a rule 2.1 is just that, you know, lawyers can also weave in moral, social, economic, political factors in the legal information, in the advice, because it's relevant which is interesting because, you know, there's law, morality, economics, social, political, like how, how do all those things parse out at what, what's law compared to those other things? And it, they all kind of, they all weave together. They're all interdependent, right? And so one of the things I always struggle with is just like, what is the practice of law? We know that lawyers have a monopoly over it. That's what the profession has provided them under the law, we are the only ones who can quote unquote practice law for the most part. And um, so, yeah, we've been granted that incredible privilege, but, you know, we think about what is it that clients are doing and, and what is law more broadly? It's relationships. It's our agreement about how we want our relationships to be. And, you know, that those agreements have really been taken out of people's hands and into the, into the hands of professionals for a very long time. But really at the core of it, like law is our collective agreements. And what is practicing law? Well, practicing law is just kind of living and acting within that vast web of, of relationships according to collective agreements and then reshaping those collective agreements. And so I feel like in an interdependent world, we need to be giving law back to the people because that is, we are going to be so much more intentional about the relationships we create together. We need the power to create them because we need each other. And so a um, couple other things I added here are, you know, examples of cartoon agreements we've created with clients and just so that people can really engage with the agreements that they're making, um, feel invited into them and not intimidated by them and to actually actively shape them by themselves. So it feels to me like our responsibility is to be working to give law back to the people. So yeah, I'm talking through this list of ways in which our client is our clients tend to be different. And one of them is I noted that they tend to be non-hierarchical and self-organizing collectives. And just more and more, I talk to groups of people and they haven't formed a corporation or anything. They're, they're a group of people doing things, which is what humans are highly prone to doing, forming groups and doing things. And uh, nature is highly prone to doing that. And in fact, you think about pretty much anything in nature, it's self-organizing, it's, it's happening, trees are growing, they're creating beautiful shapes without a leader. There's not like one little pine needle there that's in charge of everything. It's like, they're doing it together. And so that's what we're seeing more and more. And so this is a, this is a whole other rule to spend some time with, which is when our, or, when our clients are organizations and, you know, one of the things you have to figure out as a lawyer is like, who's in charge here? Uh, so like, if you're not clear what the, what the organization is asking you to do, the rules tell you go to the higher authority. And if they do not know, go to the highest authority, take me to your leader. But, 
you know, in the groups we work with, sometimes it's like, hmm, hmm, okay. And the rule is really interesting in the sense that if you're being instructed to do something that, that could substantially injure the organization, even if it's the highest authority who's telling you to do so, you actually need to exercise a little bit of independent judgment and say like, hmm, I don't know. I kind of need to sort of move carefully here and act in what's the be- what's in the best interest of the organization. How do you know what's in the best or- interest of the organization? You're a lawyer. There's the organization. And so this is just something really interesting I've noticed about how mushy. First of all, our organizations are mushy. People come and go from them. The people shaping them could be over here. They could be over here. And then here's this lawyer who's supposed to act in the best interest. Well, for me, what it's meant has been, I really need to get to know these organizations. I can't be making judgments about what's in their best interests unless I really take the time to get to know people. And COVID has actually been a gift in the sense that we have been having Zoom meetings with clients and it's enabled us to actually spend more time than we normally would with clients and with larger numbers of them, like the whole group can attend rather than trying to get everybody together in the same place. And so I feel that there's this kind of, it becomes a little bit seamless, like who's the lawyer, who's the client? And we're all sort of working on projects together. One other practice tip is just like when you are working with non-hierarchical groups and you, you know, you, you do kind of want to ask and put in the agreement, like, you know, Okay, as a lawyer, you know, who should I primarily be communicating with, you know, look for a liaison or a few liaisons, not a leader, and don't try to like impose some kind of hierarchical order on clients, because that could actually be very harmful to what they're trying to do and the relationships they're trying to create. So yeah, this is kind of how I picture our clients. Uh, And Uh, they all have relationships to each other. They're all part of this broader movement. Sometimes I think is the movement our client. All these clients are our clients, but you could also see they have all these relationships and therefore quote unquote transactions with each other all the time. And so we're, uh, it's like every week, it's like (gasps) another conflict of interest. We need to waive because the rules require us to. Um, But, you know, overall there's, there's this question I ask myself a lot because it just sort of I don't know, it reminds me of who I am and who they are and what we're all doing together is like, are they our clients? Do we work for them or do we all work together? We're working with and for each other in this mutual effort to create an independent, interdependent world. And so, yeah, a lot of mushiness, a lot of, a lot of blurry lines, but the rules do ask us to find lines and draw them from time to time. So here's another rule um, that just sort of stood out to me is we're supposed to exercise independent judgment, independent professional judgment as lawyers. And again, we are very interdependent. Uh, You know, I've talked about lawyers on interests and how that shapes things, you know, on any given day, you know, our biology, our feelings, things, the world, climate collapse, any of that could be affecting us. We're dependent on the rest of the world to kind of be, you know, okay and to be able to show up and do good work. It's um, this idea of independent professional judgment. It just feels less and less like a real thing that we can find. Um, But, you know, anyway, so just acknowledging that challenge and I'll grapple with it just a little bit more. Because, yeah, the rules around conflict of interest, I talked about them in terms of like conflicts with our own personal interests as lawyers. But yeah, then there's the fact that all of our clients, they're in these webs of relationships with each other. They're doing things together. They're having transactions with each other. And a lot of times they're like, hey, Janelle, can you help us? Sustainable Economies Law Center, can you help us? And we're like, oh, yeah, we have to do this. Um conflict waiver and then you know we need to get your informed consent and they're always they often look at us like but 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 we we all have the same interests here like why do you need this waiver like where's the conflict in fact they kind of act like the lawyers are trying to create a conflict where one doesn't already exist so the reality is our interests are largely in in confluence um but it doesn't mean there's not going to be potential conflicts so you know again it is you know, it's important to acknowledge them. And yeah, we have this duty of undivided loyalty to our clients. 
like, I am loyal to you and only you. And I can't let this other client, you know, make me waver from that. And I draw sunflowers just to talk about how weird it is in a way. It's like, you know, can you represent two sunflowers in a field? Well, they're two separate beings. They may have conflicting interests, but really like they're sunflowers growing in a field. They're all pointing at the same sun in the same ecosystem. Generally, most of their interests are aligned. And so I, yeah, I just say all this to say like our clients and we are as part of a larger movement for social justice, our interests are often aligned, but yes, anything in life. But you need to be able to show you can, in spite of potential conflicts, actual or potential conflicts, that you can provide competent representation. Um, and who judges whether it's reasonable for you to provide competent representation to say two organizations that, are, that have relationships with each other? Well, there's, there's you and your clients, you're, you're deciding together because there's that informed consent. But if you read the rules carefully, there is this concept of a reasonably prudent and competent lawyer. It's an objective concept. So it doesn't matter if you subjectively believe you can reasonably competently support a client. There's this other thing out there. And you know, based on the biases inherent in the profession, and the fact that it used to be called the prudent man rule or the reasonable man rule, that it's this white guy, you know? It's like, you know that this objective standard is extremely biased towards certain ways of thinking, certain worldviews. And so um, this is why, this is, you know, back to practice tips is like really in creating the relationship with the client, acknowledge the unique circumstances you're in, the particular interests and goals of the client, because, um, and, and both clients really, like if there is the potential for conflict, acknowledge how they are basically moving together in the same direction. Okay, one other, one other area of ethical rules, and then I'm gonna kind of bring us to a conclusion. And I forgot to mention earlier on, we'll, we'll go into breakout groups and um, kind of reflect on how people, you know, you'll be reflecting with each other, like how, are you seeing changes in the world and how do you want that to change how you are as a lawyer? And then what are some of the limitations of that, like from the rules or the context you work in? So I'm just planting that as a seed for you to be thinking about how your work is changing. But yeah, so another kind of common example with clients over the years is people are doing things that are beautiful and in some cases necessary, necessary in a life and death kind of a way in a world where there's people living on the streets and malnourished. And, you know, like I said, a lot of people have these visions to create places where people can come together and will grow food and will feed people. And, um, and then we talk to clients about it and we say, well, you should know. Uh, about zoning laws, you know, zoning laws might say you can't really have this kind of gathering or, um, you know, community activity on this land. You should also know about health and safety laws because, you know, food, not bombs used to and probably still does get shut down all the time. Like, you know, we let our clients know about the rules and, you know, often people are just incredulous to hear what the rules are. And it brings up this question, um, about of advising or assisting clients to violate the law because I kind of want clients to feed each other, you know? And um, so there is this basic rule that we're not supposed to assist or tell people to break the law. So you gotta be careful with, you know, <laughs> how you word things to clients. The law, the, the ethical rules did get revised in a way that may be significant in 2018. It used to be that, you know, you, you shouldn't advise people to break the law unless you as a lawyer have a good faith belief that the law is invalid and that there's a argument for modifying that law. And I'm like, yeah, the whole system is broken. All these laws are broken. Like there's a very good argument that we need to change a lot of things. But yeah, the, the new rule doesn't say that as explicitly. Now, again, like, I don't know if the revision was really intentional in that way. There's been 
an ethics opinion more recently about, you know, cannabis and advising clients or supporting them to violate federal law. And anyways, I would just say, spend some time with these ethics opinions. But the fact is, like, we know a lot of these laws are invalid in the sense that they're having um, harmful effects on communities. They could probably be challenged under a lot of grounds or just need to be changed. Um, you know, and as lawyers, we need to be careful, but, and so I will say like overall, you know, we take an oath to uphold the law, the constitution, you know, that's what we're supposed to do as lawyers. But the, the more I'm, the more I learn about the law and the legal profession, I really learn that the roots are quite violent. Um, and a lot of it comes down to the legal profession was created of private property and to regulate property rights. Because before there was this idea that certain property is mine, there were people collectively managing, collectively relating to everything that was around them in highly collaborative, adaptive ways. There were, you could call them laws, but it was more the sort of informal relationships and agreements that people had made with each other and continually reshape. And so I, I had to put, you know, William Blackstone is this legal scholar, jurist person from England who wrote some commentaries about the law that many people think was like so influential in shaping our whole legal system. So, you know, it's just like, you know, this this definition of private property, sole and despotic dominion, which one man claims and exercises over the external things of the world to in total exclusion to the right of any other individual in the universe. So it's just, you know, this is like, this is the legal system that I took an oath to uphold. And so much of the work in the law is about figuring out what is mine? What is an individual's thing? What is a property? Who does it belong to? And, you know, a lot is around individual rights and individual responsibilities as opposed to collective ones. And so, you know, overall, I'm like, okay, well, you know, I feel like I can work with these ethical rules of the profession. and and I'm grappling, like, how much can I continue to uphold this system when I see how much violence it's doing? So this is a table I made, you know, you saw my side by side comparisons throughout of sort of what, what feels like the old paradigm, or dominant culture, the Western tradition, and, and the ways of thinking, it's, it's an entire worldview. And you know, if, if this is the nature of reality, this thing over here on the, on the left, then, you know, our legal system makes sense. That's why, you know, I had that person cartoon with a box over their head. Yeah, it makes sense from one perspective, but that's a particular worldview. Then, you know, again, as I began to read more about and by indigenous people, about biology, ecosystems, and to come to understand that we thrive the most, like our reality and our greatest thriving is found in our interconnectedness and to weaving webs of interdependent relationships and um, self-organizing. And um, so, yeah, it's like in the context of the world and my understanding of ethics as like what we need to do in order to still be able to look babies in the eye and say, we're going to, you know, we're going to work so that everybody can be taken care of. I really feel like this new worldview is the basis on which we need to, not new worldview, ancient worldview, <laughs> new ancient worldview is the basis on which we need to really be thinking about ethics. So yeah, and it just, I feel like it feels better as a lawyer, you know, the last webinar was about competence, and substance abuse issues and mental health issues. And just like, I feel like that worldview, that very square worldview, it, it hurts us. Like it doesn't feel good. We're start, to me, it's just starting to feel kind of silly the more I think about it. And um, I do feel like, for, at least for now, we can work with the rules. We can lean into this web of interconnectedness and start to see ourselves as one. And, oh, yeah, thanks. Okay, so that was 40 minutes. I am going to now invite Chris, our one of our two wonderful tech support people, to break us into small groups and I'm going to paste these questions into chat and so you can you know get in a group with three people and be like huh what just happened okay or share a bit about 
um, share a bit about just how you've been watching changes in the world, how it's making you want to, you know, change things in your work as a lawyer, and then also reflect about the rules. Um, do the rules allow you to do that? Uh, does your work allow you to do that? And then we'll come back to a larger group and invite people to reflect on what they discussed. So go ahead and initiate breakout rooms. And then Sue, you could stop the recording and we don't need to record the last part either.